This will be very interesting, so please bear with me. Uh, so the title of ours is a little bit cheeky. It is Handling Wide Data, and we work in market research, and there's so many presentations all the time uh, with our talking about handling big data. And the problems that we experience, or not, I shouldn't say problems, but the issues that we face are different, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. There's, uh, we love the, the big data presentations, and we're quite envious of people that have oodles and oodles of rows of data. But in uh, market research, we don't have that luxury usually. Uh, we're usually uh, trying to scrimp and get as many rows as we can. So what we'll talk about today is uh, first just defining what do we mean by this nebulous term wide for wide data. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll just talk about several approaches that we've come up with for handling wide data and uh, kind of what's helped us. And then, of course, uh, have time for discussion. And I believe that I am the person standing between you and PIMS and canopies. So I think I will strive very hard to end on time. So I will... Uh, Strive for the 20 minutes. Uh, first, just a little background about Glassbox Research. Uh, we're six years old. Uh, we're a market research company. And we don't hear uh, about a lot of market research companies here at these R types of meetings. So I'm just curious, in the audience, are there any people that work in market research or in consumer insights on the client side? One, four or five hands, terrific. I'm very uh, very happy to see that. Uh, it's, uh, we see a lot of representation uh, from the financial sector, from pharma, from risk, from insurance. Uh, but market research is a little bit of a different beast, and that's where we come up with the, with the wide. Um, but what we do is, generally, uh, we provide strategic direction for our clients in terms of uh, informing their communication strategy. So we'll work across a lot of different industries. We've worked in everything from insurance, consumer package, goods like fast food, hotels, uh, liquors, uh, some really fun categories, and even some exotic ones like helping position national laboratories. Uh, so it's, uh, we've applied this approach to a lot of uh, different types of verticals, industry verticals. But the common thread that runs through all that is we're always informing the creative strategy. So uh, what you'll see in some of the examples that I present is how do we um, you know, use R to help uncover those types of insights that can be helpful for people working in marketing and particularly advertising agencies. Uh, just a little background on me is I have about 20 years of experience, and I'm not a statistician. That's why I wanted to put this up. Uh, I have my background in advertising, and then I was, I've always just really loved data analysis, and so I went back and got a master's degree in uh, data analysis, so, well, folk, computer science focusing on data analysis. And also attending the conference is Kyle Allaire, and Kyle, why don't you stand up just so people recognize you, and Mark Mueller is in the back, if you could stand up too. Just uh, if you want to chat, especially uh, we marketing folks could band together a little bit and, and chat, uh, you'll know what we look like so you can find us uh, out having drinks. So what is wide? What do we mean by this? It's really a subjective definition that we came up with. It's, it's really anything that's cumbersome for analysis or something that's really difficult to share with others. A lot of the examples of the modeling that people use for R, it'll be a very limited number of columns, but then some very impressive examples of handling millions of rows using parallel processing, all those sexy types of things. Uh, our issues or our challenges really are a lot different from that. It's it's really just this, these cumbersome having all these columns of data and how do we how do we handle that? Uh, so one indicator that you may have a wide data frame in our standpoint is if you can't just view all of the, all of it in R. So I just I have a, this is be really challenging. Uh, I have a few examples, so I'm going to, and it's a different keyboard, so I hope that uh, you can bear with me on this. Uh, so uh, instead of using set working directory, we always just create a variable which is project path in case we've got uh, our data in a lot of different directories, that way we can go directly to them. And so just we simply set that, we've, I've loaded a data frame, and we call it maybe wide. And when you do a structure on it, you get list output truncated because it's so long. It's, uh, in fact, it's hard to tell how long it is. But if we just look at columns, which is a little trick that we do, uh, we can see it's about 1,400, which is, I think, about the size of the example that, uh, uh, that uh, Joe was talking about uh, using Shiny with the, the latest data that came out from Barack Obama. 
but the, you can get around the problem with the structure being cut off when you run that by just simply passing a parameter to it. Um, but it's still really messy. It's, you know, it's hard to look at all those columns of data uh, because there's just so much of it. So we have, that's why we came up with some techniques for, for how to handle it. So the types of data that we have, um, I'm not sure if you're, you're well, you're probably most everyone is familiar with it. You've probably taken surveys or been annoyed by people that are asking you to take a survey. But we generally ask a lot of different types of questions where there'll be uh, radio buttons, check boxes. But where, there's, where the data gets really wide really quickly is when we have these types of batteries where it's on a scale, usually an agreement scale. And we ask people, you know, how well does this describe your ideal experience or how well does this describe various brands? And so this is uh, an, uh, just a typical example, and we'll have a very long battery. In this case, it was 55 different statements that were asking people, how well does it describe your ideal experience? So the question is, how can you reduce that so that there's not, and that's one small example, but it's 55 columns of data, and what are some ways that you can make that more manageable? And what we use is, uh, is variable clustering, and it's in the HMIS. Uh, package and what that does is well you'll see I'll just show an example of it. So I'll scroll down a little bit. Bear with me here. We will. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and clear this just so that it's a little bit tidier. And we'll load the library. And also um, I saw some great talks about re uh, code reproducibility. And so one thing we always do is we're very careful to clear out our environment all the time, make sure that we're running everything from the very beginning, uh, just so that there's not anything lingering around in, menu in memory that could cause some problems for us. So I'm going to go ahead and load the data file, and then I'll show it to you. This is uh, not the full data set that I just showed you before. This is a, um, a uh, has fewer data, uh, fewer columns in it. And I, I'll, I'll actually show you the columns. Let's see, it's the, there it is. Uh, so much smaller, but you can see it's got ID, status, and then it has this whole battery, the Q30 uh, battery that's in there. So what we do is uh, just, when you have, imagine that you've got a data set that's got a lot of different questions that are like this, like maybe question 30, 31, 35, that have a lot of batteries, but you just want to do a set of analyses just on some of those. We'll use the grep command just to simply pull out the variables that we care about, and then we use regular expressions to define those. Mm -hmm. So then what's in variable names is just simply the Q30s. Oops, and there's an extra little ah, typo. So just pulled out the Q30s. Uh, so then what we'll do is we'll create a matrix that just has the subset of those. So you have to imagine that this is a huge data frame that we're working with. Um, so we create the matrix of just those. Um. But one thing that's kind of frustrating is, particularly when you're working with market research data, is you don't know what does Q30 represent. So what we do is we've started to uh, merge with a label spreadsheet, like something that would typically come out of SPSS, or uh, if you're, um, a lot of times when we're fielding our surveys, the uh, People that code the surveys will have a data layout that they give us. And so it's something that we can load and we can take a look at. And I'll just show you. I mean, it just basically has all the questions and then all the labels. And so what we do is we just simply merge with that so that we can display all those. And we assign, I'm not going to go through all this code in detail. It's something that we're happy to share. But then now when we look at. Now we have something that's a bit more meaningful. And next, all the variable names have been changed from just simply Q30 to having the label associated with it. And now what we can do is we can put that into the variable clustering. Oh, and uh, what that means is that just needs to be a little bit bigger for it to fit. Mm. So this can be very hard for you to see on that screen. I have everything 
copied over to our PDF file. So this is basically the output. You don't need to see all of it, but we use the variable clustering to look for uh, where there's um, clusters of these various questions. And looking at this, you can see there's about four major clusters. And then what we can do is we look at those and we judgmentally name them. It gives us some handles that we can talk about without showing all of the <coughs> individual data. And so in this case, we had about, I think it was 17 variables, variable clustered it, and we reduced it to a size of a quarter of what it was originally. So we don't ever get rid of this data, but it just gives us something when we're sharing it with clients that we can go at a higher level and give them, kind of show them the, uh, the forest without the trees getting in the way. The second approach that we use oftentimes is uh, correspondence analysis. And sometimes a picture can truly be worth a thousand words because when you've got those types of questions where you have these batteries, uh, it can be a whole lot of combinations that you're looking at. So if you have, like, if you're looking at 20 different brands across uh, 50 different types of descriptive statements, then now you're looking at a matrix that's about a thousand different comparisons. And so we use correspondence analysis. The benefit of correspondence analysis is it shares, it conveys a whole lot of information at one time. Usually we're plotting brands and then all those descriptive types of statements, like is it approachable, or reliable, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, so it gives us an ability to quickly see what are the relationships between the data. And then the other nice thing that we found is just when we're meeting with our clients is that when you're sharing a picture like this of the data, that it starts to create a common language and people can, even people prior to the project, prior to the research coming back, if uh, there were some political disagreements with the direction of how to position a brand, suddenly when you put something like this in front of someone and they can see that where the brands fit, then they can have good ideas and, and can align on how to best reposition the, the brands. So we find that it uh, helps a lot, even just politically, for people to get onto the same page. So an example, and this will go a little bit more quickly because we've covered some of our approach for it, but we'll just load the data. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just pull out the variables that we care about. In this case, it's M29 is the variable that we're looking at. The what um, correspondence analysis expects is a uh, a table that's aggregated by the different brands. So in this example, what we have in the data frame is everyone was rating. Let's see, I'll show you the columns. Um, so everyone was rating various proteins. So it was center of the plate proteins is what the project was for. And so what we did is we aggregated the mean scores for what you were saying, like a question battery where people were describing the various proteins. And I'll show you what that looks like. Well, it's kind of, it's so small, but it, uh, it's basically just a matrix that's for every single question or the pro how the protein scored. And just like we did last time, we'll assign the variable labels because the M29s uh, aren't very helpful for us. And then what we'll do is we'll run the correspondence analysis. And there's a lot of code here, but there's a, some great examples on the internet. And we've pulled a, a simple example here, but it's uh, What we're doing is we're running the correspondence analysis, and really what we care about are the coordinates for where things plot. So I'm, we're extracting out of that CA fits, well actually it's called CABCA right now. Um, we're extracting out the coordinates. Uh, I'll show you what the structure of, this is what the output out of the correspondence analysis looks like, except I have that on. Yeah, so there's lots of information in here. It has uh, information about the rows and then also information about the columns. And we're primarily just simply for this plotting, we're just wanting to look at the, the coordinates. So we use ggplot for that. Very excited after everything that we've learned about Shiny uh, to apply Shiny uh, to this to really make it look... Oh. Yeah, you can kind of see that, but what you see is like at the top left, it's, it's beef, and it's beef is indulgent, it's a special treat, something people enjoy. The opposite of beef is chicken, where it's something that's healthier, and it has a lot of flexibility. So this just gives us a way of seeing how do people describe the various proteins, and how are they different from one another, and we can do that very quickly.
Now, the last thing that I'm going to talk about is um, the kind of like how we analyze all the data. Oftentimes in um, in market research, what we want to do is we want to compare various groups of people. Like we want to compare maybe by demographics, males versus females, people that are older uh, versus like millennials, for instance. Or maybe we'll create clusters or segments using something like k-means. And so what we find is that we oftentimes want to be able to compare between groups across every single question in our questionnaire. But as we talked about before, the questionnaire is full of all different data types. There's some that are uh, single buttons, there's multi-clicks, there's the batteries. So what we've done is we've created an approach for that. And this is something that's not packaged, and this is something that kind of want to gauge the, your reaction to it and see if it's something that's useful to, to folks like you out there. I think it's something that we'll package for ourselves to use internally, um, but it's not something that we've made available quite yet. And what these functions do is allows us to incorporate it into it as reading labels, often like what we've been doing for the correspondence analysis example, as well as for the variable clustering. Uh, also reporting the mixed data type, so we have functions to report all different types. And then um, to enable us to share all of this information with our clients more easily, we can export it to spreadsheets. So we do all of our analysis in R, but clients will want to see, even after our presentation, you know, have a reference deck that they can go to to see how people responded to every single question. So these functions allow us to do that. And I'll just show you a few examples of that. I'll clear this. So we, uh, in this example, we need the NMIS library uh, because we uh, use data weighting. Um, that's the other issue that is uh, we've had. It, 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 R supports data weighting, but it's not always uh, very, very clear and transparent. And then I'm just going to load in. These are all of our profiling functions. Uh, they have not been packaged yet, so there's a whole lot of them. Uh, just like last time, we'll set the project path. Oops. And we'll load the data. And uh, I'll show you what that data looks like. So it's got ID status, and then Q2 is gender. <laughs> Q age cat is uh, from the uh, survey program where it's the age categorization. We've got the weights. Question 18 is a multi-check, and then we've got our Q30, which is the one that we vari variable clustered earlier. And I'm just going to load it, the, um, the labels just like last time so that we've got that. So all this is not anything new that I'm covering yet. But now this is where we start to get into our approach for this is we, um, we're going to just report things by male, female. So I'm going to create a group, um, grouping variable that we can use for that. And then, and then the next step is uh, we just set up, I'm not going to go through all this in, in super detail, but basically what we do is we initialize a report. And so basically what we're doing is we're building a data frame that allows us just simply to add on to the bottom of it things that we want to report out. So in this case, uh, what it's doing is we've just initialized it. So it has our total column, the groups we care about, and then a comment. It's URL <laughs> that, we're, uh, that we're looking at. And so first example is um, we like to report the sample sizes so what you can see is that we've got sample sizes the raw sample sizes and then we've got sample sizes that are weighted and so what you'll see is that we're just simply generating this this profile object it's just really a data frame and we're just adding rows to the bottom of it for things that we care about and it's uh, what we found is that we were initially programming all this by hand so that we could then uh, run through a script once we created groups that we care about, like through k-means segmentation or something. Um, but this is so much faster for us once we have this set up. And it, honestly, it only takes us like a couple hours now to write. It looks like a lot of code, but you were just cutting and pasting. And we could simplify it a whole lot. The, uh, we think that the beauty of it is that it um, allows us to you know, just add this. So here we've got gender. You can see that, of course, it matches our columns. Uh, so that's easy. So without even having to specify any labels or anything, the functions, we just simply pass to it which question is it we want to look at. Q2, it goes out and does the work. It takes care of the weighting. It takes care of looking up the labels. And then, uh, but that was an easy one. We've got the age category, which is a little bit more 
complicated of an example, or it's just a bit longer. And then we've got an example with checkboxes. Um, so the checkboxes are different than male, female, which is radio buttons, and they had to add up 200%. This is, so it was going out and it was looking at, um, I can't quite read that from here, but uh, when it comes to, I think, preparing meals, I am primarily responsible for dot, 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 and people could check, oh, okay, I'm responsible for doing the shopping, for the preparation, all that stuff. So, uh, but it went out and looked up all this information for us. And then just to bring it all home, uh, this is the last example, is we can also, in that variable clustering example that I showed earlier, we found those four clusters. Uh, what we can do is we can pass to a, a profile factor label function that we've written the, the, the variables that fell into that factor and we can label it. And so there's the one that we called it was handy, and then within that, so it reports the mean score across all the detailed uh, questions that made up that factor, uh, and then also all the, the detailed ones. And so then it's really very straightforward then from this point just to do the rest of the factors. And you know, factors is a bad word to use with R. It's it's from my I'm come from the SAS days as well, and uh, we used factors when we would create from the variable clustering. But uh, factors is a totally different thing within R. So I don't mean to use the uh, to confuse you. And this is the last bit where then we've got every one of our factors. And it was really pretty quick. I mean, we can turn, we can crank these out fairly quickly, um, and it's just very useful for us to. Because we're always slicing and dicing the data and looking at it a million different ways, and we want to be able to look at where did all these questions vary based across the different groups. And this is just a way that's allowed us to not have to leave R, R, R to do these types of analyses. We can run the k-means. We can even insert this type of code after the k-means and start to see uh, what's really differentiating for the different segments. So, in summary, um, you know, what I hope that we've shared with you are some techniques that you could use even across different industries. If you do find yourself with a whole lot of columns, what are some techniques that you can use to manage that better? And then also those techniques can help uh, in sharing uh, the data uh, you know, with, with your clients, et cetera, um, more. So, uh, but I will be interested just when we have our discussion to talk about you know, what you think about the reporting, if it's something that you guys uh, run into, a type of issue or something that you're looking for. Um, but that was it. Mm.